Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. In this lecture of EC 2026 Introduction to Signal Processing, we'll talk about the ideas of beat frequencies and amplitude modulation. These are essentially duals of each other, basically looking at this trigonometric identity from two different directions. We have this trig identity that says that if you add the cosines of two different frequencies, that's equivalent to multiplying the cosine of the average of the frequencies, multiplied by a cosine with a frequency of the difference of the original frequencies divided by two, all times two. That's a consequence of this identity, cosine alpha times cosine beta equals cosine alpha plus beta plus cosine alpha minus beta, all divided by two. This is the only trig identity I have memorized. It's easy to memorize because you don't really have to keep track of where the minuses go. And if you need any of these other identities, sine times cosine or sine times sine, you can always turn the sines into cosines and then use this identity. And if you have frequencies, 2 pi, ft, whatever in here, but you also have some plus or minus phases, well, you can then use this identity to handle those cases as well. And to give credit where it's due, this is from Dave's short trade course. Now, which one of these do you actually perceive if you listen to it? That depends on F delta. If F delta is large, so the sinusoids are widely spaced, then you perceive two separate tones. If F delta is small, you'll perceive a tone of a frequency FC that has a weird warble. So let's listen to an example of that. So here's a 400 hertz tone. And here is a 420 hertz tone. And if we play those together, we get this. So it's got this weird warble from this amplitude modulation effect. We wind up with this 410 hertz tone. That's the average of 400 and 420. And we wind up multiplying that with this 10 hertz cosine. Now the actual frequency of the warble you hear isn't 10 hertz. It's 20 hertz. That's because your ear can't perceive one of these positive going humps from one of these negative going humps. Musicians use these beat tones when they're tuning by ear. They're basically trying to reduce the frequency of the beat. Here's another example. That's a little higher in pitch. And we can implement that by either adding these two cosines with frequencies of 672 and 648. Or we can multiply these cosines with a frequency of 660 and a frequency of 12. And to be particular, don't forget to multiply by 2. Either of these will give you this signal. Now notice in this particular instance of the spectrogram, you don't see this kind of beating effect. You see two distinct tones that are constant all the way through. But that's only for a particular choice of window size. I don't know exactly what parameters my colleagues used to create the exact waveform and spectrum shown in the previous slide. Here, I'm creating the waveform using this version of the formula, but I could also use the version that's equivalent, that's the sum of two cosines. I'm making it 0.4 seconds long with a sample rate of four kilohertz. And what I'm gonna do is show you the time domain plot and also show you the spectrograms with a series of different window sizes, starting with 1024, and then going to 512, 256, 128, and then 64. Here's the time domain signal, where you can see those beats. Now, if we look at the spectrogram with the 1024 window size, you can see two lines here next to each other. You don't see the beat structure, but you do see the individual tones. Now, if I shrink that to 512, we're increasing the resolution in time, but decreasing the resolution in frequency, so the two tones are a bit blurred. And here, they smush together, and you start to see the structure of what's happening in the time domain, but we still don't have very good time domain resolution. 
So we can go down to 128. And then finally, we're at 64. And we don't see two tones anymore. But we do see that beat pattern. So there's this trade off between frequency resolution and the choice of window size in the spectrogram. And one extreme sees the two separate tones as constant tones. And the other extreme looks like a single sinusoid multiplied by a lower frequency sinusoid. Now we started the lecture by talking about two tones that were closely spaced in frequency, but we can look at it from the other direction and imagine we're starting with a deliberately amplitude modulated wave. So here, this low frequency like the signal sine 2 pi 12t would be thought of as a modulator, and the cosine 2 pi 600t would be thought of as a carrier. Those are terminologies that come from communication schemes. And indeed, this kind of scheme is an amplitude modulation communication scheme. Usually you're sending a more interesting signal than just a sinusoid. So you can think about the function here as being the actual signal of the voice of a radio announcer that you're wanting to send over the airwaves. If you're sending over the airwaves, you wouldn't be using 660 hertz here. You would be using something like 660 kilohertz. Now there are musical applications where you do use an audio frequency here. When you use this kind of modulation as an audio effect, it's often called ring modulation. In my EC3084 lecture series, I have an entire lecture on amplitude modulation where I use the machinery of the continuous time Fourier transform. We don't cover the continuous time Fourier transform in 2026. So in this class, we're sticking with simple sinusoids. This formula is basically the same as the one we just looked at. To spice things up, we put a sine here instead of a cosine, but this is going to sound the same. Now, if you wanted to find out what this looks like as a sum of cosines, you could turn this sine into a cosine and then multiply the cosines using the trig identity I showed you earlier. But what if you're on a desert island and you don't remember what the identity is and you don't have your trig tables? If you remember your inverse Euler formulas, you can expand the cosine as the sum of complex exponentials and the sine as this difference of complex exponentials, where you have to be careful to remember that the minus sign here goes with the minus sign here. And while with the cosine, you just have this factor of 2 in the denominator, with the sine, you have a factor of 2j. You can then just do the algebra on these exponentials and expand this out. And if you wind up figuring out what's happening with the minuses and with the j in the denominator, you can then recombine this and write this as the sum of cosines. Notice there's a phase of minus pi over 2 here and a phase of pi over 2 here. So if you look at this form right here, although you could readily get it from here as well, the spectrum of this amplitude modulation signal looks like this. You just have two real sinusoids or four complex exponentials. Incidentally, in this particular case, the greatest common divisor of these two frequencies is 24, but you don't want to read too much into that. One word of warning, if I were to take this 660 hertz and turn it into 660 kilohertz, this doesn't actually describe the amplitude modulation scheme that's used in commercial AM radio. This is describing what would be called double sideband amplitude modulation with suppressed carrier. In a real AM broadcast system, you would typically have a constant added here that results in a big carrier wave present in the signal, which helps make your receiver simpler and cheaper. But we won't get into that here. In our SP First toolbox, we have a GUI called BeatCon where you can play around with beat tones.